It's 2025, and in the last 5,000 years of human civilization, we've made some pretty amazing strides and done some fairly impressive feats of engineering and construction. But there's one big thing that we just haven't gotten quite dialed in, and that is the dumping of raw sewage into our waterways. The scope of the issue is pretty staggering. An estimated 50% of the world's sewage makes its way into waterways untreated. Even in developed nations like the United States, we have cities all over the country that simply accept untreated sewage overflows that measure in the millions or in some cases billions of gallons per year. So why is America, the same country that sent a man to the moon and invented the personal computer, still unable to avoid dumping poop into the same water that we drink and swim in? The problem is multifaceted, but arguably the biggest problem is our sewer systems. When a lot of American cities were first being developed, there were less people and less understanding of the downsides of dumping untreated water into rivers. Many of the early sewer systems in America are what we now know as combined sewer systems. These took on both the role of a sewer system and a stormwater management system. The big problem with these systems is when they get a big influx of water via a significant rainstorm, they simply don't have the capacity to contain and treat all of the rainwater sewage mixture. Structured overflows allow the excess untreated liquid to be released into waterways. According to the EPA, there's over 700 communities across the U.S. that have these dated combined sewer systems, nearly all of which suffer from some degree of overflow. Most of these communities can be found in the Northeast and Midwest. Take New York, for example, the richest city in the world. That same city is responsible for between 10 and 30 billion gallons of untreated sewage rainwater mixture being dumped into waterways each year. According to New York's Department of Environment, modernizing the system would cost around 35 to 40 billion dollars. This is unquestionably a lot of money, but if it was prioritized in the same way as something like, say, decarbonization, there would absolutely be the resources to address the issue. Just as a comparison, and this is not an apples to apples because I know the one is kind of a private project, but this isn't that much more expensive than the Hudson Yards development is expected to cost at final build out. With 10 million people in the city of New York, the sewage system is never going to be totally perfect. But if we can fix the low-hanging issues and address, say, 90% of the problem, our waterways could be entirely transformed. Nature is remarkably resilient, and when we aren't constantly dumping chemically-laced human sewage into it by the millions of gallons, the waterways do a remarkable job of healing themselves. Reportedly a few hundred years ago, the Long Island Sound had 200,000 acres of oyster beds, enough oysters that it could filter the entire water volume every few days. Unfortunately, the problem's not just limited to communities with these combined systems. In places like Baltimore, that actually do have separate sewer and stormwater management systems, there's still issues when it rains. Rainwater can enter the sewer through cracks and gaps in the century-old piping. At this point, the separate sewer system runs into essentially the same problem that the combined systems have. More sewage is moving through the system than it can handle, and some is discharged through structured overflows. One of the most frustrating problems with a place like Baltimore is how it's not a lack of resources, but largely human incompetence that's played a role in the ongoing poisoning of the Chesapeake Bay. Unlike other systems, Baltimore has the benefit of having separate sanitary sewer and stormwater management systems, yet they still end up with millions of gallons of untreated overflow every year. Much of this is due to maintenance issues at the Back River Wastewater Treatment Facility, a facility that, when it was built, was seen as a world-class plant. Unfortunately, Baltimore did Baltimore things, and management of the plant got so bad that they had to turn over management to a private contractor in a deal potentially valued at $100 million over eight years. These issues led to diminished capacity and system failures, continuing to cause millions of gallons of overflows. Unfortunately, this is only one of a number of issues in the city of Baltimore, and I'm sure there's similar problems in other cities that have led to preventable sewage overflows. Another illustration of how inept Baltimore has been in dealing with this issue can be seen on their interactive map of stormwater management improvements. The map shows some of the small-scale projects that are being done to address the runoff side of the stormwater management equation. This map goes all the way back to 2015. Of the thousand or so projects listed, only 19 have been completed and three are underway. This issue of polluting our waterways needs to be tackled with a sense of urgency, and a pace like this will, will mean that we're never able to keep up. 
Now, it's been in the news lately that Baltimore has been really celebrating how the inner harbor has become swimmable almost 90% of the time based on water testing and bacteria levels. There was even a couple publicity stunts recently done where people went swimming in the inner harbor to celebrate the progress that's been made. And while it's great to appreciate progress, it's important to understand the bigger picture. If someone's an alcoholic and they cut down from drinking a 30 pack a day to drinking 29 beers a day, that's great, but they need to keep the pedal to the metal because addressing the issue is a time sensitive thing. It's also important to consider what 90% really means in this context. It doesn't mean the inner harbor gets an A. It means that during dry weather, bacteria levels drop below the threshold that's considered dangerous. On the flip side, it means that pretty much every time it rains significantly, the inner harbor is inundated with a toxic mixture of human waste, runoff, industrial waste, medical waste, and all the other unpleasant chemicals coming out of the city of Baltimore. A day or two after the rain is done, the toxins get flushed out into the Chesapeake Bay and then out into the Atlantic Ocean at which point the inner harbor is technically swimmable again based on bacteria levels. But it's not like these waves of human waste and chemicals went away. They were just pushed further down the bay and into the ocean. Each one of these overflow events can have devastating impacts on the bay, releasing toxins, encouraging the growth of bad bacteria and algae, and killing large chunks of marine life. Days later, the water tests may show that the bacteria levels are down again, but the damage has already been done and it can't magically be undone. The only solution is to stop these overflows. In June of last year, there was an event where 150 people swam in the inner harbor. Mayor Scott and other city officials joined in on the fun. Scott saying he wants to continue changing the narrative around Baltimore. Three months later, this picture was taken in September following a significant fish kill event resulting from dangerously low oxygen levels in the water. While local officials largely dismissed the fish kill as a natural event caused by variable weather and changing water temperatures, nothing about this looks particularly natural to me. So there's got to be a solution, right? Some cities' sewage problems are more challenging than others based on the various situations that they're in. But at the end of the day, we're not talking about rocket science here. We're talking about poopy water running through a big pipe to a treatment plant. There's really only two pieces to this equation the treatment capacity, and the volume entering the system. Increase the capacity at the water treatment plants, and where that's not possible or where it's cost prohibitive, add surge capacity in the form of temporary holding tanks. Start by figuring out where the biggest problem spots are, the places where we're talking about millions or billions of gallons of overflow. Instead of dumping the sewage into the rivers, dump it into a holding tank, then process it over the next several days and weeks as treatment capacity becomes available. On the input side, start to divert storm water to reduce the impact of rainstorms. In places that have combined systems, start splitting off the largest storm water inflows first. In places like Baltimore that have separate systems but major leaking issues, systematically replace failing sections of the system. Where full-scale replacement is too difficult, trenchless pipe repair can present an interesting and less invasive alternative. Also, using new technologies like remote cameras can dramatically increase the efficiency and speed of these types of repairs. Sewer systems have been in use for thousands of years in some form or another. As a society in 2025, we're advanced enough and we have enough resources that we really shouldn't be content with the status quo, especially when the status quo means dumping billions of gallons of human feces into our water. The fact that the question isn't if a city is dumping raw sewage, but rather how much raw sewage they're dumping is kind of embarrassing. We should demand more from those running these systems, particularly in the instances where these problems are being largely caused by incompetence and indifference. On the bright side, there have been some success stories. Boston, one of the oldest cities in America, had a very problematic combined sewer system that frequently overflowed raw sewage. The South Boston CSO Tunnel was a project to create a 19 million gallon holding area for excess sewage and rainwater so it could be properly processed. This prevented millions of gallons of sewage from being dumped every year through dozens of prevented overflows. South Boston now has some of the least polluted beaches of any city beaches in the Northeast. So at least there are some examples of this problem starting to be addressed. One final point, and perhaps my biggest concern of all, 
Given all the medications people are taking, as well as recreational drugs, appropriate sewage management and water treatment is more important than ever. It's been shown that a lot of these compounds linger in wastewater longer than previously had been thought and are harder to remove than many traditional pollutants. So it's critical that at the very least we stop dumping large quantities of untreated sewage containing these compounds. I've said it before on previous of my videos, but cities really need to focus on the basics, infrastructure, education, and public safety. The solution to these problems may not be easy, but largely they're pretty simple. In the case of this issue, one of the biggest changes that could be made would be to expand the environmental movement to include a bigger focus on water pollution. Trillions of dollars have been spent in the last two decades on developing and building out renewable energy sources, but keeping chemical-laced human feces out of our water and oceans has sort of fallen by the wayside. If even a fraction of this renewable energy spending was shifted towards addressing water pollution concerns, huge progress could be made, and maybe places like Baltimore's Inner Harbor could actually be swimmable once again. Thanks for watching. New videos out every week. And if you could, please subscribe to the channel. Right now, only about 2% of the people that watch my videos are subscribed. So if I could get that up to even, say, 5 or 10%, that would do wonders for both me and this channel.